All of us believe that we're here today, as it's so frequently expressed in our meetings, thanks to the grace of God in AA. Most of us learn about the grace of God through experience with someone who has known of it and who is able to mediate it to us. The entire movement has come to know of the grace of God as it has been mediated to us by our next speaker. And I'm very happy that she has been able to come to the coast and be with us this afternoon so that you may feel and come to know the sweetness of her spirit, the depth of her concern, and the effectiveness of her service to suffering alcoholics. Sister Ignatius. My good friends, I feel Alcoholics Anonymous is part of my family, really. I uh, know that God works in mysterious ways. How little I thought when I entered the convent that I would spend my days, at least as many of them as I have, in caring for alcoholics. And certainly his divine providence has directed all this. He can use very weak instruments to carry out his designs. You see many wonderful results. Nothing short of miracles. God is extremely kind to the alcoholic. I feel that uh, it's a privilege to work in this field. Bill asked me to say a few words about how we got started in Aspen, I hardly knew myself. I was sent there in 1928, just as a change of occupation for a while. I was in the field of music, and as you know, that's rather nerve-wracking. And uh, <laughs> a change might uh, be good for me. So uh, I was sent uh, to St. Thomas, which was just opened in 1928, and it was there I met Dr. Bob. I didn't know they had a drinking problem, and in fact, I wouldn't have known it had he not told me so, because he didn't come to the hospital when he was drinking, evidently. Oh, I can recall uh, sometimes his voice was rather reverberating. I <laughs> I could hear him when he came in the back door. He had a decided New England accent. Somehow I liked him because he was so straightforward that I enjoyed working with him. And one day he looked rather down. I said, Doctor, what's the trouble this morning? Well, then he told me. He said, well, sister, he said, I might as well tell you. I came in contact with a New York broker and uh, I've had a drinking problem for a long time and somehow we got together and we tried to work out something that will help these drunks, he said. We've uh, been trying it out. They tried a few rest homes and the other hospitals and he said, Sister, would you consider taking one? Well, I hesitated because some time before, I took a man in who, oh, he looked, um, I didn't, I didn't know much about this drinking. I knew some could drink, I <laughs> think some could drink and handle it well, and others couldn't. So, uh, they called me to the emergency, and I went down and talked with him. Oh, he said, this if I could just lie down a little while. He worked at the city garage and looked like a very respectable person. I've been drinking a little too much and I want to get straightened out. Which I thought was a good thing. <laughs> well, the only bed that uh, we had at the time was a bed in a four-bedroom. Then we knew nothing about special treatment. And uh, I signed him to the man on service, registered him, put him to bed, and I said, you won't cause any trouble. Oh, no, he'd be an angel. <laughs> Well, I forgot about him. When I came over early the next morning, the night supervisor, who was tall, sister, we all teach her about her big feet. Well, she was standing at the door waiting for me. She said, the next time you take a DT in this place, please stay up all night and run around after him as we had. <laughs> 
that wasn't the end of it either. I decided then that that's enough. I often felt sorry to see them turned away, but I was not the last word in the hospital. So when the doctor proposed my taking a real, uh, as I thought, a real <laughs> Well, you can imagine my misgivings. I thought, oh, dear me. I, I told him about this experience, and I said, Doctor, not only will I be put out, but I said, the patient and everything else. I said, I don't think they want alcoholics. So he said, Sister, this patient won't give you a bit of trouble because I will, I will medicate him, I'll assure you. Well, very... Fearfully, I said, well, doctor, I shall take him then and put him in a two-bedroom. I thought I was doing pretty well because we were so crowded in those days and uh, beds were at rather a premium. Doctor then came to the admitting office. He said, sister, would you mind putting my patient in a private room? I thought I had done pretty good to put him in a two-bed. <laughs> He said, you know, they, he said, there'll be some men come to visit him, and they like to talk to him privately. <laughs> well, I uh, said, I'll do what I can, doctor. After he left, I went up and looked the situation over. And right across the hall, we had a flower room where we used to prepare the patient's flowers. And I thought, well, they can fix their flowers somewhere else for today, and I believe I could push the bed in there. <laughs> That's what we did. And his visitors came. We kept a close eye on them. <laughs> I did. <laughs> it was all on you. And I thought, well, am I the respectable-looking men? They don't know that they ever took a drink. <laughs> and uh, went along. I thought, now, the next time, I won't have this trouble. I'll put him in a private room. I didn't know much about these alcoholics. I was not an expert. Surely the Lord picked out a, a weakling when he picked out me, I know. However, I took him down to the room, as I would any patient, and then I was taking the chart to the desk to explain to the nurse a little about it. I couldn't tell her too much, but said Dr. Bob would give her the orders. And wasn't he down after me? <laughs> well, he had his short son and everything else. And I, nearly, I nearly went through the floor because the nurses all looked and everything. And I said, you go right back to him, we'll be right down. So the nurse came down with me, and here he was under the bed. <laughs> well, I thought this will never work. I don't believe this will go at all. I'd better put two together the next time. I didn't want to give up at once. But I know after that, I put two together, and then finally we took a four-bedroom, that seemed to go pretty good. One would help the other. So then we took another two bed across the hall. Well, it was hard to say no when they really wanted to do something about it. And by that time, the men were coming in quite often. So much so that some of the sisters said, who are these fine-looking men that come in so often and seem so interested in the patients? And uh, I didn't say much at first, but I later I said, well, that is AA. I said, what is AA? Would you like to know something about it? Well, yes. Well, I'll bring some literature. Then. That's how I gradually got them. But, of course, before that, a committee from Alcoholics Anonymous talked with Sister Superior, and uh, she knew what we were doing. And she said, uh, strange, she said, when we had them at charity, they'd be running around the halls and doing a lot of trouble. But since Dr. Bob is treating them, we don't know that they're in the house. There's no problem, as far as I can see, just go right along. We had a small accident ward, and there we put in a coffee bar, and Dr. Bob set up the program. 
the first opportunity he had, he brought Bill over. Of course, I couldn't imagine who this wonderful Bill was, but I soon learned. God had chosen two great men. What one didn't have, the other supplemented. And together, they were perfect. Had God picked up two great religious leaders, no one would have come near them because the alcoholic doesn't want anything about religion or God, nor do we try to preach religion to them. But they aren't in for very long until they're asking or telling you what experience they've had and what they'd like to do. They know they haven't been living right. And I feel that, as many of our nurses have said, the best sedative is peace of mind. If once they can be relieved of their anxieties and worries and treated properly, there should be no trouble. But anyway, during doctor's time, I think we treated between four and five thousand. And he treated them every day unless he was out of town without any charge. He said, that's my contribution to AA. And the man who gets this problem is everlastingly grateful. Sometimes he'd make rounds and he'd come down and he'd say, Sister, let that man go home. He doesn't want this program. Oh, but Doctor has a big family and he has this, that, and the other. Doesn't want the program, Sister. He isn't ready. We take them but once. That was Doctor's plan, too. I thought, oh, my. That's kind of strict, isn't it? But, oh, I see the wisdom of it. Because if there is a merry-go-round, when that temptation comes, you want to think, well, I can get back in there for five or six days. Well, that'd be all right. Sister's good. She'll take me back. And I'd only be encouraging my drinking. They know that it's a one-way trip. The sponsors, their cooperation is tremendous. Any hospital who tries to just take them in on their own is very foolish because they need the sponsorship. I often say it's something like learning the technique of golf. You may know all the angles and all the rules, but unless you get out there in the field and do some footwork and practice, you won't be much of a golfer. Many of those first AAs would take them into their own homes and try to help indoctrinate them. They worked in groups. It was marvelous what they did. But however, we certainly have found that it was very wise because the sponsor will not bring them until they are ready. And then we, he screens them carefully and goes over it. We want to be sure the sponsor is not just a person they met in a bar somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> then uh, one day I got word, we're just like people in the army, you know, we go to where we're sent. I often wondered whether I was off the mailing list or whether I was forgotten. <laughs> I, was, I was there for uh, 24 years, probably one week short of 24 years. And uh, finally, the obedience came that I was to go to charity and work with AA there. They decided to build a new wing and all the extra, so they kind of forgot about AA. But Reverend Mother didn't. She saw much good in it, I know. I went there in August, and I didn't hear a word. Finally, one day, I got a call. The bell rang furiously and said, Superior wants you. She's on your floor. And I came down, and the architect of the new building was there, and um, the director of our nursing service was there. Perry said, what kind of a setup would you like for this AA? Well, you imagine standing in the middle of the floor and feeling rather strange. I didn't know whether I was at home myself or not just yet. And I uh, couldn't think very fast. So this nurse uh, said, uh, well, sister, are they violent? I said, no, they're not violent. Oh, they're not intoxicated. Yes, they are intoxicated. <laughs> but they're clear enough to be screened because we must make sure that they want the person. 
Well, she said to the architect, you won't need those cages then. <laughs> well, I said... I said to Mr. Rockin, would you mind... Give me a few days and we'll drop a little plan of what we'd like. Fine. Well, the day that they came was on the feast of our Lady of the Rosary. That's how we call it, Rosary Hall. And connected with that, when I was moved there, I thought, oh, I'd love to have this in memory of Dr. Bob. Well, rather than call it the alcoholic ward, we'll call it Rosary Hall. And I'm thinking of marking their robes, R.H., well, I've done all I need is a nest, and I have doctor's initials, R.H.S. Robert Holbrook Smith. So we call it Rosary Hall Solarium. <laughs> to admit to this award, you must be sponsored by a member of AA in good standing. You must also evidence the desire, not just to get sober, but also preserve and perpetuate your sobriety on a day-by-day -day basis. Unless you yourself are willing to admit that you are an alcoholic, you are advised to seek help elsewhere. Every evening, a member of AA comes to the hospital to conduct a brief AA meeting for the patients. An attractive coffee bar stands in the center of the hall where AA members and the patients often gather to discuss their common problems. The remodeling and construction work for the solarium was done by members of AA who contributed their time and money. Members who belonged to the building trades worked day and night during these spare hours to complete the lovely quarters at no cost to the hospital. Rosary Hall accepted its first patient one year ago, and since that date, 1,000 men and women have been hospitalized therein. We have much room for women. We're hoping to get more. Oh, usually we have three, sometimes four, and even a stretch to five, but that isn't good. They have been offered not only the key to sobriety, but also the key to a happy sobriety. The Sisters of Charity and the members of Alcoholics Anonymous decline any individual credit. They are aware that it is in giving we receive. Well, God bless you all, and I wish you a continued happy sobriety. May God's grace be with you always and bless every one of you. Thank you.